Hello and welcome to Photo Walkthrough Tutorial 9 Chapter 1. Well, the big news this week is the launch of our new group of photography podcasts, the Photocast Network. Chris Marquardt came up with the idea, and together he and I have spent the last month or so contacting the best podcasters in the area of photography and asking them to join up. And I'm really pleased to say that we've had an overwhelmingly positive response. We've got some really big names, including tips from the top floor, the candid frame, light source, two-minute Photoshop tricks, the simple photo minute, radiant vista, and Martin Bailey photography. In short, the Photocast Network is the place to go if you're interested in photography. And as the network develops, we hope to start running some collaborations, and you might even see some new shows. All in all, we believe this is a very exciting time for podcasting and digital photography, and it's our hope that the Photocast Network will give us a stronger collective voice for speaking to the industry, the media, possibly sponsors, and to you guys, the audience. My other piece of big news this week is that UK listeners can find the whole of Photo Walkthrough Tutorial number 6 on the cover disc of the new issue of Digit Magazine. That's a full 90 minutes of Photoshop training, and it comes with issue number 104, which should hit the shops this Thursday. Digit is a great magazine for digital artists, and I recommend you check it out. Now, let's get on with the tutorial. If you subscribe to the podcast feed, you might have been surprised yesterday to see an audio file, rather than a video file, fall into your iTunes or your feed catcher. Put simply, I've decided that as well as covering my own photos on the show, I'd also like to cover the work of some other very talented photographers, and I've been keeping an eye out for images that both appeal to me, and that aren't the kind of thing that I've done myself. With any luck, that should provide some variety on the show, and let me introduce techniques I've not covered before. To start that off, I've asked Michelle Jones, a very talented British professional photographer, to be my first victim. I picked on her because she posted this really interesting and moody photograph to our Flickr group. It caught my eye with its grungy, gritty style, and the fact that she's joining in on the Flickr photo walkthrough group sealed the deal. Now, as well as showing you how the picture was produced myself, I want you to know what the artist had in mind. So yesterday, I launched the audio file you should already have, which is an interview with Michelle, where we talk about this picture and her work in general. So for the full story, I suggest checking out the interview and then watching the videos. OK, let's begin by taking a look at the first layer in Michelle's edits. So let's open up Michelle's edits here, and you can see all the layers. I'm just going to turn off all but that first layer. And what you can see uh, Michelle's done here is she's copied the background layer. And then she's done a few different things to it. First of all, she's um, sharpened and added curves and levels adjustments to that. Um, and I can cover those things later. Um, she's also put it to uh, soft light blending mode and set the opacity to 70%, which means that this is mostly going to, if I turn that on and off, mostly going to increase contrast, it's going to increase edge definition. Um, and the key to this layer is that she's added a layer mask. Now without that layer mask, you can see that that, oops, without that layer mask, I'm just shift clicking on the layer mask, you can see that, that would affect the entire background of the image. With the layer mask, it's only affecting just the cannon and just the ground and the railings around it. Now, key to this is that layer mask. Um, because she's not just used it for this effect, where she's increasing the contrast of the cannon, she's also used it to blur the background. Now, unfortunately, those changes um, were lost. Uh, I think you heard in the interview that Michelle wasn't able to find the original file without the blurred background. So I'm going to show you quickly how she blurred the background, but I'll have to pop to another image just to do the final step of that. But before we can do that blurring of the background, we need to make a layer mask of that quality. And this is a very, very good layer mask. Um, if I alt-click on it, you can see it's an extremely detailed layer mask that shows you all the edges of the cannon and the railing around it. So how does she create a layer mask like that? Well, alt-click on that. I'm going to turn all those layers back on and then hide Michelle's edits. Right. I'm going to go through a couple of the, the various selection tools. Um, and just quickly race through a few of the things they can do. You'll all be aware of the rectangular marquee tool. So let's just select some of the basic areas of the, ma of the, the image that we're going to want selected. Um, now, if, a couple of basics here. Uh, obviously, you can draw a rectangle over the areas that you want. I'm not trying to make a perfect selection here. Now, you can add to that selection by holding down the Shift key. 
and when you hold down the shift key you get this little plus symbol on the on your cursor that's going to add to my selection so if I hold down shift and start clicking around my image the areas that I want now you can see I've managed to select a bit of the background there through the railing that I don't want so if you hold down the alt key you get a little minus on your, set, on your cursor and I'll just draw with the shift key and with the minus key around the various areas of the image that I want so the shift key and the alt key and obviously on the Mac uh, it's option instead of alt um, just blocking in some of the main areas and then of course we can also do I'm clicking and holding on the curse on the button there the elliptical marquee again you can hold down the shift key and we'll just try and get this front of the gun in there and you can see I've, I've overshot a little bit so control Z undo that command Z on a Mac we'll just see if we can get this the end of the cannon Let's see if we can get the end of the cannon nicely selected there I'm going to show you a better way of doing this in a minute and this is too difficult with the with the elliptical marquee so let's go on to something else um, now these layer masks that with sorry these um, uh, selections that we're creating here we don't want to throw these away so what I'm going to do with with the selection still going I'm going to duplicate my background layer and I'm going to do that by clicking on the background layer and dragging it to the new layer icon and that'll give me a background copy for the time being I'm just going to call that layer one and what I'm going to do because I've got this selection selected and I want to keep it I want to add to it I'm going to create a layer mask and because I had the selection selected that layer mask gets created with uh, the areas that I had selected in white and the areas that I had unselected in black so we've already got the beginning of our layer mask now the next thing I'm going to do I'm going to start using a couple of the other selection tools you're probably familiar with the lasso tool very useful for just sort of drawing areas around I'm doing this with my mouse and you can see it's extremely hard to be accurate oops extremely hard to be accurate with a mouse not a good selection at all so control D deselect your selection let's just try it with a graphics tablet probably also going to be rubbish with this yeah that's still really hard not a great selection good bits and bad bits going to get rid of that as well uh, remember you can still do additions and subtractions from your selection so if you if you did get a good bit and you wanted to build it up a little at a time you can hold down the shift key do a little bit of selection let go hold down the shift key you, I'm getting the little plus symbol on my cursor to say that I'm adding to my selection do a little bit more and let go and I could build up my selection that way and also of course you can zoom right in down to the pixel level if you like and go in and select that way if you've got loads and loads of time on your hands um, a better way would be to use the magnetic lasso which is going to work pretty well in areas where there's strong contrast like here so once again holding down the shift key you can see as I draw I'm trying to keep the lasso near the line I want it to spot and it's making a little path around the edge of the, the cannon there hold down the space bar and drag just to move around and this is now where the magnetic lasso is really letting me down because when I let go I have my cursor in the wrong place and you can see we've got a, um, a bit sticking into the middle of the cannon there magnetic lasso not really that easy to use particularly if you zoomed in a long way and you wanted to do very accurate selections and it's very easily fooled it's just jumped it's hard to see on the video it's just jumped to a black line that's just inside where I wanted it to select but if you've got a very contrasty subject 
magnetic lasso might be your friend. So let's just add that to the rest of our selection. So we're starting to get, you can see there's that bit that, that came into the middle of the can and that was when I had to drag my screen in order to see what was going on. Um, we can start making our selection, building it up using all the various selection tools. Um, and of course I haven't mentioned yet the magic wand, uh, which once again you hold down the shift key to add. I can shift click and the magic wand now has just managed to add all this bit here as well because it was a similar colour to the colour I clicked on. So let's control Z to undo that. Make the tolerance down 16, something like that. That's a little better. Nope. <laughs> There we go. Uh, very tricky on an image like this. We've got a lot of very similar colours within this image, so it's going to be tricky to use the magic wand. The magic wand basically chooses colours that are within a certain distance of the one you click on and adds them to the selection. So um, and we've got a selection here that we're working on. We're building it up, but it's a little hard to see what's actually selected and what's not. So the next useful tool for making the selection is the quick mask mode, which Michelle also mentioned in the interview. So I know she used it for this. And with the quick mask mode selected, you can see that the areas that are coloured red are the areas that are unselected, and the areas that are coloured uh, the same as the original image are the areas that are selected. So we can see right away that there are a couple of areas I've missed in the middle of the cannon front there. So I'm going to grab my lasso tool, pop out a quick mask mode, and with the shift key held down to get my plus, I'm going to move those, move those into the selection as well. And then how do we add these to the layer mask that we've been selecting? We can do that in a couple of different ways. We can right click on the layer mask and say, add layer mask to selection and that's added the selection that we've just been making to the selection that we've just added uh, to the selection that we had in the layer mask and then on the layer mask we can just fill that area with white white is my foreground color so alt delete with the layer mask selected adds that to the layer mask and we've now got I can control D to remove that selection again I'll click on the layer mask, you can see that that selection we've made up there is now added to that layer mask as well. So we're building up a layer mask that looks like the selection we want. And we're just using a different tool each time just to show you the various different ways of doing these selections. Um, now, I'm going to briefly touch on the pen tool because the pen tool is probably the very most precise way of making a selection and it's going to suit us pretty well here because we've got some fairly straight lines and some nice curved lines so I'm going to just start out I'm just zooming right in and I'm going to start out just by clicking in one of the corners here and that's going to make a point and I'm going to click in another corner here and that's going to make another point I click up here and that's another point and it's not just a point-to-point -point polygon tool because when we get to a curve in a moment you're going to see that it's got some neat tricks up its sleeve okay that's that's a pretty good place to pause I've just created a whole series of points just by clicking on the corners of where things meet and you can see it's a pretty good selection so far but we've got this little bump here that we need to put into our selection so first things first control or command on the Mac changes your cursor into this little white arrow and that allows you to click on a point and drag it around and then alt or option on a Mac gives you this when you put the cursor over a point gives you this V cursor which now allows me to drag out spline handles. All I did was alt click on the point and drag it out. And you can see that's giving me spline handles. They're called spline handles because this is a this, this line that we're working on here is a spline. Now we, again with the alt key or the option key held down I can click on an individual spline handle and split it so that I can say for each half of the curve either side of the point how that curve bends. 
and you can see the curve there sort of bumping right out, bumping in and I'll just drag that point around until the curve matches the shape of the thing I want to select. So in this case it's about there. Control click on that point there, just drag it down a little bit and I'm going to alt click on that point as well and just get myself some spline handles there. So I need to make that spline that point there needs to be a, a sharp corner so I have my different my spline handles pointing in different directions and then if I want to carry on with my selection click back on the last point you did with a control key command key if you don't do that it's going to really confuse you what happens next so uh, where you want to carry on from control click or command click on that point and then carry on making points now there's a couple of different ways you can use this this pen tool this happens to be the way that I find easiest a lot of people will teach you differently how to use the pen tool and that's fine there's no right or wrong way it just so happens that I find it easiest to put a whole load of points in as you're seeing here and I like to get to a point where I've sort of I've got a whole load of points put in and I can then go back and see how my how well my selection is doing so we worked on that bit here I'm going to come back to here and this time there's a little curve here that I want to represent so um, that point there is the first point where I need some spline handles so control click on the point to select it and then optional click on the point to give me some spline handles and then correct that line that went wrong there because of the spline handles always come out in pairs so I'm going to just drag that line around there so you can see the line now nicely follows the edge of the the edge of the cannon just drag that come up that point in there. Just use the control key just to click and select and drag that point around. Now this point's going to be very tricky. You can see me going right into pixel level here. This I'm afraid is if you want a really good selection, you do sometimes need to come in right down to the pixels. The more time you spend with this, the better the selection will be. Right, and I think I'm probably going to stop with the pen tool there. I think you can see the kind of thing I'm trying to do. Oh, there's another one there. Just give myself some spline handles on the points where I need them. Control click on a point to select it. Alt click on the spline handles to move them. Control clicking on that point, alt clicking on the handle, control clicking again, alt click and drag out to give myself some handles. Now sometimes you get this where the, it goes a bit funky and it's because you've dragged in the wrong direction. You want to try and drag your spline handles out in the direction of the path. So I've been going from left and I turned this corner and went up. And the reason that went a bit funky there when I clicked on the point is I click down and it, as you can see it, the, the spine handles go the wrong way so if I alt click on the point and drag up in the direction that I was making the path then it'll behave a little bit more predictably and you won't get so confused so just dragging these points around until my curve just nicely fits the edge of the shape I want to work on control click again and because it's the last point I can't drag out a a spline handle on that until I place some more points. So you can see that I could go on for an awfully long time placing pen points all around this cannon, but what I'm going to do instead, I'm just, this is just trying to demonstrate some of the selection techniques here for you. So I'm just going to select a reasonable region and close the path. Because now that that's a path, it's not a selection, it's a path there is a distinction. A path is a, a hard edged thing. A selection is actually a, um, a bitmap so you can have pixels that are grey or white or black and the ones that are white are selected and the ones that are black are unselected and the ones that are, that are grey are kind of selected. So a 50% grey pixel in a, in a layer mask or in a, uh, in, in a selection is 50% selected. There's no 50% with a path. A path is uh, it's it's a, a vector thing. It's it's actually a series of coordinates, uh, point to point to point, and the spline is 
even when you've got those curved splines, they are mathematically drawn curves. They're not they're not grey pixels. So to see the path that we've just created, we go to the paths palette. And you can see that the path we've been working on is called the work path. And there's a couple of other paths in the, in the file here. The top two are ones that Michelle created. The railing one is one that I created uh, while I was preparing for the show. And the work path is the one that we've just been working on. Now, if you don't want to lose the work path, double click it and rename it. So in this case, I'll call it part of Canon. Now, if I want to turn that path into a selection, I can do that by right clicking on it and choosing make selection. And it's now going to say, when I make this selection, do I want to feather the radius at, at all? And in this case, yes, I probably do. I'm going to let it feather, the, feather that edge by one pixel. So I'm going to press OK on that. And we can see that's now marching out selection, just like we've had before. So if I go back to my layers palette and click on my layer mask, once again, with the selection selected, I can uh, Alt Delete because white is my foreground color, Option Delete, and just fill that part of the layer mask with white. So that now, if I Alt click on my layer mask, you can see that area that I selected with the pen tool is filled with white. Or if I, here's another useful useful keystroke with with the layer mask on D cursor. Control or Command click on the layer mask turns that layer mask back into a selection. And then I can use the Q key to see where I've got selected. And all of this region here was the region that I added to the selection with the pen tool. So that's a, a few useful techniques for adding uh, points to your selection, saving a selection in a, in a layer mask. Um, once you've eventually got a selection like this, uh, I'm going to throw away all that work I've just done, and I'm going to use, I'm just going to delete that layer mask, and I'm going to use Michelle's path, which is this one here. So selecting that path, make it a selection, press OK, let it feather it, and then come back here to my layer, and turn that into a layer mask, just by hitting the new layer mask button there. So the white areas are the ones that were selected in that path, and the black areas are the ones that weren't. So, uh, once you've got a layer mask like that, or a selection like that, or a path like that, they're worth hanging on to. They get reused in this image as well, especially. Um, this selection is going to be used not only for um, blurring the background, but also for applying that contrast that we saw right at the start of this tutorial. So, um, it's useful to be able to save these things. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to Alt click or Option click on that layer mask so that you can see the black and white version of it there. And if I press Control A to select all and then copy or Control C, Alt click again on the uh, the layer mask uh, and I can Control D to deselect the area that I had selected. And I'm going to make a new channel. Um, oh, I can throw that one away. That was me messing around earlier. Uh, I'm going to make a new channel by creating, pressing the new channel button here, which is going to come in black. Control A, Control V, or edit, paste. It's going to paste the layer mask that I had off that layer into a new channel. And I could call this Canon Selection. And that's a pretty useful way of saving a bitmap selection. Channels are, are bitmap things. Paths are vector things. Um, we are saving a bitmap channel as a, a, a bitmap selection in the channels palette there, and that's something that we might use later on. Particularly, we might use that in a moment when we come to do the blurring of the background. Um, now, the other thing we can do is save this uh, uh, layer mask as a path. Um, and the way we do that is we need to turn it into a selection first of all. So we turn a, a, turn a layer mask into a selection by Control or Command clicking on the layer mask, and we get the marching ants. And now if we go into the Paths palette, in the, in the menu in the top right corner of the Paths palette, we have this option Make Work Path. And what that'll do is pop up this window here that says, I'm trying to turn a bitmap into uh, a mathematical line, a mathematically de de designed line, so I need to know what the tolerance is going to be for what counts as an edge. Um, and I think the best thing to do here is to take the default of two pixels, 
and that creates a new work path here which once again we want to rename it so let's call that John's path and now we've got that selection that we've worked so hard to create we've got it in our channels palette um, which if you click on it shows you just that one we don't want to do that we want to we want to see the RGB channels um, and we've also got it saved in our paths palette so when you save this file if you save it as a PSD those things will get saved alongside it if you save as a TIFF I think you can save channels along with a TIFF I'm not sure if you can save paths um, but um, uh, definitely worth hanging on to that selection you're going to reuse it so the final step I said I was going to show you how uh, you can blur the background I've still got that path selected so I'll just go into the paths and click off that John's path there um, the final step how you might blur the background now this background's already been blurred and it doesn't make a very good demo if I blur a background that's already blurred so I'm going to go to another another image that I've been working on as a demo for this which is one I took a few days ago going up one of our local hills um, now the reason I've chosen this one is that it's got a very strong foreground middle ground and background so we've got this this is a, a the white thing here is a trig point which is one of the points used for mapping um, ordnance survey data within the UK uh, and this is a plaque that's been placed on the top of the hill which is called the hill is called the cloud and we can see they've got lines radiating out to all the various nearby towns and landmarks um, so what I was going to show you was how how we might blur that background and it's it's reasonably sharp but not hugely sharp in the background there uh, as you can see I was very close up on the on the plaque here so what I've done in my channels palette using all the selection methods that I've just shown you I've created a blur channel and I've actually done two steps here um, I've done a mid-ground step where I've created the uh, where I've made my selection in gray and I made a foreground which I've selected in white and the reason for that is that when it comes to blurring this I'm going to use the lens blur tool which will understand that that uh, mid gray um, is less selected than white which is completely selected and it will blur depending on how bright that that information in that channel is so I'm going to go back to just looking at my RGB channels and it's a black and white image so it's really just gray rather than red green blue but um, forgetting that for a moment I'm going to make a copy of my background because I don't like to destroy my originals I will call that blur layer and with that layer that blurring layer selected I'm going to go to filter blur lens blur and this gives probably the most realistic lens blur uh, of, of any kind of filter you could do a Gaussian blur here but it wouldn't allow the sort of uh, capability that I'm going to show you here now this lens blur window is too big for my screen of course so uh, you'll have to forgive me on that but the bits that we need to be able to see are all at the top here so what I'm doing is you've got this option to say where you want the source information to come from I could just blur the entire image if I say source none it'll blur the foreground and the midground and the background all by the same amount and the amount that is blurred is controlled by this radius slider here so if I drag that up you can see it blurs it an awful lot and I'm, I'm going to work with it high just so that you can see the effect here but you can also select uh, your based on the transparency of the layer or you can select based on the layer mask which is something that would have been useful if we'd carried on using a layer mask but in this case I've saved my blurring information the bits that I want blurred more or less in that blur channel which is the uh, in the channels palette remember I said that we can save the selection as a bitmap information in the channels palette that's what I've done and I've called it blur channel so I'm going to choose blur channel as my source now first thing you might notice the background sharp the midgrounds a lot less sharp the foreground completely unsharp that's because it's interpreting the information in the in the uh, channel that I saved backwards and you can say which bit you want in focus by changing the blur focal distance so I it was completely backwards so I've dragged the blur focal distance right to the other end from 0 to 255 and that's now got the foreground completely unblurred it's got the midground slightly blurred or quite a lot blurred and the background completely blurred so I'm going to drag that radius down until it looks sort of realistic and the way I want it I wanted it to look 
like a shallow depth of field image. And I think probably for the purposes of demonstration, there's pretty good. So all of this foreground is nicely in focus. My midground, if I turn on and off the preview tick box here, the midground is getting blurred a bit, and the background is getting blurred a lot. So if I press OK on that, it'll apply that filter to the image. And that's a reasonable example of how you might go about blurring selectively part of an image if you wanted to do like Michelle did and perhaps remove some unsightly details in the background um, or if you wanted to give a, a sense of depth, shallow depth of field to an image. And of course, when you're using these blur channels, let me show you that blur channel once again, um, you, you can you don't just have to do flat areas of color like I happen to have done here. You can do grade, grade, uh, use the gradient tool to do graded areas of uh, different colors. So you might have it graded from white through to black. And that would give you a varying blur along the gradation if you use that blur channel when you come to do the lens blur tool. So that's all I'm going to do for today. There's an awful lot of stuff in there. Um, the real key to this particular chapter was selections. Lots of different ways of making selections, lots of different ways of saving your selection and keeping them so that you can reuse them later. When, you, when you're doing all these edits on your, on your pictures, I do recommend that you're very careful with your selection before you start making any changes to the image. And those selections are things that you can save and reuse, so do. Um, that's everything for this week. Next week, I will come back and carry on through Michelle's image. And I think our next step is going to be to do some brushwork. So I will catch you next week. Thanks for listening. Photocastnetwork.com, your photography resource in the potosphere. Photocastnetwork.com.